What's up, my healthy friends? Here we are back for another dose of the good stuff. It's me, it's you, and it's today's fabulously intelligent guest. First, though, the big picture stuff, which is in 2023, it's my mission to coach 500 people to stop the binge eating and savage self-talk cycle so they can lose weight whilst feeling in control without restriction along the way. Now, that fabulously intelligent guest I was talking about is the amazing Dr. Amy Moore. And she's a cognitive psychologist and the director of research at Learning RX World Headquarters in Colorado in the USA. She specializes in cognitive training, ADHD, neurodevelopmental disorders, brain injury, and learning disability. Loads of her research has been published in peer-reviewed medical journals and psychology journals. She has a PhD in psychology and a master's degree in education and has been supporting children and families in complex situations for more than 25 years now. She's also the editor-in-chief of Modern Brain Journal, as well as being a TEDx speaker. I checked that out last night. You should too. It's amazing. And the host of the Brainy Mums podcast, which she was kind enough to give me a gig on recently. So thank you, Amy, for that. And a big warm welcome to the show. How are you doing, Amy? I'm doing fantastic, Maddie. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, thank you for having uh, me on your show. I really appreciated that conversation we had uh, a little while ago. Me too. And you're coming back to my show in in a month or so. Yes, I'm excited for that conversation. I'm excited. But before we get into that conversation, you're a cognitive psychologist. What exactly is that? Can you kind of explain what that means for the listeners? Yeah. So cognitive psychologists are really interested in how people think and learn. And so instead of studying emotions, we study cognitive skills. So memory and attention and the skills that we use all day, every day in, in thinking and learning. And so that's, that's the short version of what a cognitive psychologist does. Gotcha. And, and how did you get into this field? Like, why was that of interest to you? That's a great question. So I was a teacher and an educator prior to going to get my PhD in psychology. And what I noticed was we were missing something in the classroom. Um, Children who were struggling to learn, we would accommodate those learning struggles by, you know, seating them at the front of the room or giving them extra time to complete assignments. But it wasn't getting to the root cause of what was happening. Um, to these kids who were falling behind and really struggling to learn. And so that struggle is not just an academic struggle, right? It doesn't just impact grades. It impacts self-esteem and self-confidence. And it really influences the interactions with the family, right? Because homework battles in the evenings, it's just a really frustrating situation all around. And so I kept amassing this stack of oh, I should research that someday ideas. And when I finally said, okay, I'm going back, I'm going to get my PhD in psychology, I'm going to figure this out. Um, That's how I landed on studying how we think and learn and not just how we teach. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating, the school system in general, because you know, obviously it was created in an era to produce factory workers that are all going to go and do the same thing. And now we're in, especially in the Western world, we're very privileged to have the awareness and uh, information that helps us understand that people learn differently. uh, And that, you know, trying to put everybody into the same box in a classroom is probably not the best way to get the best out of people. Um, Do you feel like the, the school system is limited and it categorizes people as having learning challenges when actually they just learn in a different way? So I like that question too. Um, I've always wondered why we teach children the exact same things from kindergarten through 12th grade when people don't grow up and do the exact same things, right? I mean, we're we're not producing, like you said, factory workers. We're not producing robots everyone has different interests and and skill sets. And so while we've kind of debunked the neuromyth of learning styles, because what we have found is everyone, unless they have a brain injury or a sensory deprivation of some sort, everyone is capable of learning auditorily, visually, kinesthetically. Everyone can, but that doesn't mean that everyone prefers to learn in each of those ways. And so preference really impacts motivation. And so 
motivation impacts learning. And so if we don't recognize that some children really do prefer to learn one way over another, then we're not doing anything that you know we should be doing to leverage their motivation to learn. So that is absolutely one aspect. Um, and then the school system is limited because you you are teaching to the masses. And so the outliers do get missed. And so when we talk about outliers, I mean the kids who are exceptional performers and then the kids who have a genuine learning disability. And so that's where the struggle kind of happens, right? The middle, the middle of the road, the middle of the bell curve learners are doing okay. Um, and that's just a byproduct of how the system works. I mean, when you teach 30 or 40 children at a time. Yeah how do you reach the outliers, right? It's no fault of the teacher. It's the system. Which, which makes total sense. Like there's obviously limitations and, you know, in an ideal world, everybody would have their own customized, perfect situation to be created. But also, we, and this is what comes up in my mind when you talk about the connection between motivation to learn and the way that people learn is that, and this is just throwing sort of a curveball out there. And I just love to sort of see where you take this, which is, that in 2023, which we're in now, like we've got a world where kids in the Western world, the likes of the US, Australia, England, a, a handful of other countries are so wrapped up in cotton wool that now we have to motivate kids to be interested in doing stuff that would that benefits them. And what I mean by that is that like, I feel like there's, you know, the further we go in wrapping the world up, not just kids, but adults as well, in safety and needing to feel good before they act, we're having a massive loss in resilience and people just executing tasks unemotionally, not needing to be really happy about what they're doing and not needing to be really fulfilled by going to school and learning or going to university. Once upon a time, that just used to be a function of what we needed to do in order to get there. And we, we didn't have all of these emotional attachments or stories to that idea. Whereas it feels like now nobody wants to do anything unless it feels good and they feel like amazing about it. And they need to, I, I can't do that unless I feel motivated. You know, it's like you've got a job as a cleaner. I don't really resonate with sweeping, so I don't really do it, you know. And it's like, and so I'm just wondering, like this connection with motivation, um, like is that, is that moving in a direction where we're co constantly looking for motivation and then in the absence of motivation, we're kind of useless when I, in an ideal situation that produces better outcomes, we don't need motivation at all. It's just a, an auto, sort of an automatic function that we engage in. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I need to walk that back a little bit because I'm not suggesting that we teach so that everyone always feels good about themselves and that grades aren't important and that we shouldn't work hard. We just want to be happy. And that, that actually was a philosophy around the turn of the century. And we see in America mm -hmm. what happened to that. Now we don't have proficient readers at high school graduation because the focus was on self-esteem and let's just make everyone feel good about themselves and not push them to work hard. So let me just say that we made a huge mistake going in that direction. But what happens is we throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We swing the pendulum to the exact opposite you know, side when we find that something doesn't work or we want to try something new, right? We just go all in and, and then we forget about the stuff that actually was working. Um, and so I think we have to find a balance. And so... Um, and there's a psychologist, um, Robert Brooks, who talks about finding children's islands of competence. And so mm. what he says is that children who struggle swim in oceans of inadequacy. And so when they're constantly struggling and constantly failing, then they feel bad about themselves and they're not resilient because they just fail and fail and fail. But if we can identify those islands of competence in the middle of this ocean of inadequacy, those things that they do really well and can master, then that builds resilience. And when you are resilient, then you can handle the struggles because you're achieving mastery in another area, because you're getting that sense of satisfaction and accomplishment in, in one or two areas of your life. Um, and then that can help cushion the blow a little bit on the struggle. And so I think that we just 
pound in on these, well, you've got a D in this class, you have to focus on this class and you can't play sports until you bring that grade up. Well, if sports is what this child is great at, what they're accomplishing at, what they're achieving mastery in, why would we take that away? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Great question, yeah. Right? When totally. that yeah. that child's resilience can be built by achieving competence in that area. And then that helps them when they have to attack the stuff that they are struggling and that, and that they're not as motivated to do. But there are hoops that we have to jump through, bottom line, right? There are things that we have to do that we're not always going to like as children and adults. That's that's life. There are tasks in our jobs that we don't necessarily like, but oh well, we have to do them. Um, and so there are things, though, about our jobs as adults that we hopefully do like, and then that can make up for the menial stuff that we don't. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, since leaving my day job to run my own show uh, over two years ago now, it kind of blows my mind that that's been two years. I am not very good at doing the jobs that I don't want to do. <laughs> I don't think any of us I need, I need. I think I need to employ a boss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you're identifying a potential solution. <laughs> As you were talking just then, I was thinking too, like, because obviously if we we champion children and adults in the areas that they're most competent at, um, obviously it builds their self-esteem and self-worth and, but equally society benefits, right? Society, family, community benefits, because we're getting somebody that's proficient and great at a particular skill set. Um, and so that leads me to ask, and this is possibly moving into parenting f- philosophy a little bit, but do you think... Do you think that it's better to find the area of competence and exploit that as much as possible? Or do you think we should focus more on our weaknesses to sort of create more of maybe a, you know, bring those up to be more of a level sort of stable across the board kind of person? Or should we be really good at one one thing and then outsource all of the others to the other people that are good at those? So I think the answer is both. So I I think that we absolutely need to pour into those areas that we're good at and that we're interested in, again, so that we build Mm -hmm. resilience. But then, yes, we have to work to bring up the weak areas Um, because some of those, okay, do you need um, calculus three to be a psychologist? Probably not. No, you don't. And so if if I have to struggle through calculus just so that I can get my degree, then, OK, that's all. That's what I, that's the best I'm going to do. Right. I'm just going to struggle through it. But if I'm going to be a mechanical engineer, I can't just struggle through yeah. calculus. Right. I've got to get tutors to help me really learn calculus if that's what I want to do with the rest of my life, if I want to design car engines. so. Um, I think it it's a both and 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 then an if, right? Like, what is the actual what is the actual scenario that we're looking at? You know, when what what my research focuses on is cognitive training, and so that's that's our philosophy is that what you do well, we don't spend a lot of time on. We spend our time on improving those cognitive skills that are weak. Um, that need to be strengthened so that then you can do everything else better. Yeah. Well, and I guess as well, learning to do those other things that you're not very strong at will often support the one thing that you are really good at. And for instance, it's like if you're good, say, at business, but you can't manage your money, then it kind of doesn't, business doesn't work out, right? So you might have to yeah, get some of those other skills that support the end result. And it's like, if you're a great public speaker, but one-on-one, you're not really good at networking, you're probably not going to get many gigs, even though you're great at it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So with um with uh, cognitive training yeah. and learning, what is like the 101? Like what, if ever, anybody takes anything away from this episode, like what do we need to know about that world in order for our, us to live our lives better? Yeah. So like I mentioned in my intro, um, we use cognitive skills all day, every day in thinking and learning and reading and communicating. And those skills are things like 
working memory and long-term memory, attention, the speed that we process information, um, our ability to visualize information, our ability to manipulate sounds in the English language, that's called auditory processing, our reasoning skills. Those are all called cognitive skills or thinking skills. And so if we have one or two of those cognitive skills that aren't strong, then it can impact our ability to think and learn efficiently. And so cognitive training is repeated engagement in targeted mental tasks that are designed to strengthen the weak cognitive skills. Um, if you want, I can do a really fun demonstration with you to show you how those skills work together. You want to do one? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, so... Um, you're in Australia, so I can't do the one that I usually do, but um, <laughs> I'm going to give you 10 seconds and I want you to spell the name of your capital backwards. Ready? Go. Oh, God, this is not going to be good. A R R E A. Oh, my God, that's so All right, right. stop. <laughs> You're out of time. <laughs> I'm going right. to have to Google so it. So, first. See. <laughs> so first, what, what is, is your like capital? Backwards? Canberra. Okay. So first, you had to remember what your capital was. That's mm -hmm. long-term memory, right? Then you had to decide on um, a strategy for solving that task, right? And, and so that's reasoning, logic and reasoning. Most people project the word in their mind or in the air. Did you did you try to do that? Yeah, I even looked um, up if you to did. like see it in the the, yeah. the air. <laughs> exactly. So that's visual processing or visual visualization. Okay. Then you had to keep track of which letters you had already put into the word and which one was coming next. That's working memory. And as you manipulate those letters in order, that's auditory processing. And about halfway through that task, your mind might have started to wander or you might have gotten frustrated and wanted to quit. And so you had to engage <laughs> your attention skills. And I only gave you 10 seconds to do that task. So you had to do it fast. That's processing speed. So that one really fast task engaged seven cognitive skills. And so you can imagine if you had one or two of those skills that wasn't strong enough, it would really make you struggle. If you had three skills that weren't strong enough, you couldn't do that task at all. And so right. thinking is complex, right? We don't realize how many skills we use and how they overlap and how we have to engage them in that's a simple task. So imagine having to solve, you know, a harder one. Well, if that's a simple one, everybody that listens is now acutely aware of my very low IQ. <laughs> 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 well, I will tell you, most IQ tests um, put a, a larger weight on logic and reasoning than any of the other skills. Right. So if you can reason well, it won't impact your IQ score as much. Okay, gotcha. I, I think I think I can do all right. I did an IQ test once many years ago. Um, yeah, and I don't know what it meant really, but um, I was like, I can talk to people, so I can basically, you know, that that's that's good enough. I like my EQ levels a nice level. <laughs> Absolutely. So we do IQ testing um, in the cognitive training world because we want to see it's not the, the general IQ number that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. We use all the subtests that make up IQ to see which skills you're struggling in. And so those are really important tests for us so that I can give you that test and I can see, whoa, you've really got to work on your memory or, oh my gosh, mm. you're really struggling in your visualization skills. So it really helps us pinpoint which skills need the most work. Does that mean you can change your IQ? Like as in once you Absolutely. pinpoint those areas? Yes. So it, it was thought for a long time that IQ was fixed, right? You, you, you got what you got. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I like to say, uh, we are not stuck with the cognitive cards we've been dealt. They're changeable. Mm -hmm. Our brain is plastic. Neuroplasticity means that our brains can change with experience. 
And so that experience can be targeted exercises that improve those individual skills that make up your IQ score. Yeah, right. Okay, that's good news. Now I want to take an IQ test to see if I've gone up or down. (laughs) And you do see fluctuation throughout your life um, because there are two parts to SMART. So there's how well you process information, how efficiently you process information, and then there's information that you know. Right. So what you learn in school versus how efficient your brain is at processing information. And so a full scale IQ test is going to test both of those things. Um, And so. That can be affected by lots of things as well. I mean, you can be sick, you can be tired. um, Yeah, you can be hungover. I mean, there are like lots of reasons (laughs) why your IQ score might be different today than next week. But generally, without an intervention, it doesn't move much. Yeah, and as as you sort of talking, I'm reflecting on the past and thinking that most people as well from when they may have been tested as a teenager or when they were younger to maybe midlife, they've probably also eaten a whole truckload of unhealthy food, vegetable oils, sugar, all of the stuff that damages our brain, damages our arteries, damages the way that we manage stress and, and like, you know, a lot of the sugar damages the hippocampus in the brain and and all of these yep. processing centres that can are, are physically destroyed by the diet that we live and the excessively stressful lives that we live. So I'm assuming that has some impact on uh, IQ as well or the, or just brain function in general. Absolutely. I mean, we know, we've looked at studies where we know that gluten binds to neurons, right? So if you're, if you're eating grains and grains and grains, right, then <laughs> that's going to impact neural pathway efficiency. We know that sugar is inflammatory. And when we think about sugar and inflammation, we think about it inflaming the body, right? Well, the brain is attached to the body. It's part of the body. So if your body's inflamed, your brain is inflamed. Yeah. So absolutely, um, sugar and grains can have a huge impact on it. I mean, if your omegas, if your ratio is off, right? We know that we need omegas for every cell in our body. There are cells <laughs> in our brain, right? And so we just don't we don't think of how we eat as impacting our brains. But I mean. of neurotransmitters are produced in the gut, not in the brain. Yeah, I think that surprises a lot of people actually to learn that their stress hormones and their happy hormones are predominantly hang out in the gut. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, which is why I guess when you, you're nervous or you're excited or you know you feel it in your stomach, it's a, it's a real guttural kind of feeling that you experience. Absolutely. And if you're, if you're eating um, an enormous amount of gluten – and those tight junctures open and you've got leaky gut, that's directly going to impact how your brain is functioning, not just giving you a stomach ache. Yeah, totally. I'm speaking your language now, huh, Maddie? I know, I know. This is, <laughs> we're probably going to talk more about this when we jump on your podcast next. But something I really want to ask, um, I'm curious to know in regards to cognitive function, learning, training, how has social media impacted the way that kids learn because uh, like we're, we're like kids these days sitting on their phones and adults as well like we're all hyper addicted to these dopamine micro doses of dopamine that these things give us whether we're bouncing between netflix our phone you know the sugar in the cupboard like we're constantly on go 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 and so there's I'm wondering how does that affect learning? Uh, is the, I'm assuming the attention span of most people these days has gone through the floor, which inevitably I would assume reduces our capacity to learn because we can't stay focused on a task long enough to put it into long-term memory. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, it's, it's definitely impacting attention span um, for a couple of reasons. One, because... Um, what we see in technology is exciting, right? So it's it's loud, it's fast, it's brightly colored, it moves, there's some gamification involved. So it's super exciting. And that that attention that we pay to this really exciting dopamine rush reward system um, that social media gives us 
then by comparison, reading your textbook certainly isn't going to hold your attention the same way, right? Your, your textbook is not gamified. Um, so it impacts it that way. And then um, memory is impacted because everything is in our handheld computer now. And so we're not forced to remember anything. It's there for us. And so we can just look it up anytime. Like, I, and I, I'm guilty of this too. I don't know everybody's phone numbers by heart anymore, right? Because they're in your smartphone and your phone is smarter than yeah. you in terms of remembering phone numbers. But that's just a tiny bit. I mean, you, we aren't forced to remember anything because Google will tell us. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I thought would be the case. What, what, what do you think are the consequences, you know, in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of a society that stops using its memory? Yeah. That's, that's a big question and scary. Yeah. Right? I think so too. Because ultimately what we think is saving us time will actually increase the time it takes us to process things later. Because if we don't memorize, then do we have to stop and look things up every single time? Mm. So, I mean, you can imagine if you're trying to problem solve in the engineering world and you haven't remembered any formulas and you have to stop and look it up every single time, that that's actually going to slow you down, not speed you up. Um, yeah. So I, I think that – well, and I shouldn't even just say in engineering. Like, let's look at psychology. So – you're in a, a diagnostic interview with a client, but you can't remember what symptoms lead to what diagnoses, right? And you have to stop and look it up every single time. Um, yeah. And I mean, we've watched the medical field go to that, right? With a handheld physician's desk re reference, which is great. So, I mean, it, it helps cut down on mistakes, but I think it also is a crutch. It keeps us from having to remember things. I could have huge fallout. Yeah, and I think especially in fields where there's the human element, which is not necessarily in a textbook, particularly with psychology, right? You're, you've got to read energy and emotions and understand the complex nature of the information that you're being given. Same in a chronic disease setting as well. And sure, the textbook can tell you A, B, C, D, maybe all the way through to, you know, G, H, F, whatever it might be. But in fact, the human element is kind of like omega, or an alpha that's not even in the alphabet. It's something that you have to calculate and process and figure out, you know, in a really human way to, to be able to understand where that person's at or what they need. Um, and, and I really think a lot of that, there's a few people that are intuitive enough from a very young age to figure it out, but that comes from experience and remembering that experience and how all of the other people navigated this kind of gray area. Uh, and without that, like, the kind of human element of interaction, I think, falls away and we just become robots analyzing each other. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the biggest predictors of academic success in learning something new is your prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. So because we are cons constantly building on our prior knowledge, I mean, we create schema or mental frameworks of everything. And so with every new thing that we learn, we add to that schema, right? It's like a filing cabinet in our brain. And so if we can't remember what's in each file, right, then how are we going to add to it? How are we going to ever learn anything that's more significant or more strategic if we can't remember the basics in each file? Yeah, yeah. Well, and so I guess in in order to try and save the world from this dystopian future that we're painting for them, um, like what what do we need to do? Are there apps? Um, do you think that we need to um, go on dopamine fasts? Do we need to break our relationship with our phone and become less dependent? What do we need to do to sort of reclaim our own brain function and memory building capacity? Yeah, I think that we need to get back to some of the basics, we need green time, right? So we need time outdoors. We need to have our feet in the grass. And um, so that outdoor time is a natural break from technology. So if we're 
if we're mm-hmm. playing sports or if we're taking a walk around the neighborhood. It doesn't have to be an outdoor sport, right? Just time outside, even if it's sitting on the porch play, or playing with your dog. Um, so absolutely need some outdoor time, time in nature, green time. Um, breaks from technology. Instead of adding an app that's a game, play a board game. Mm-hmm. So board games not only improve cognitive skills and, and different games improve different skills and some of them overlap, um, but it also increases social connection, right? Because if you do a family game night, then you're going to be connecting with other people in your house, not over the phone, face to face around the table. And that's a super fun way to be taking a technology break. You're still engaged. You're still getting a dopamine rush, right? Because if, especially if you're competitive, um, but you're building your brain skills at the same time and building those relationships with others. Yeah, I love that. And then read a real book. A real book? That's crazy talk. <laughs> a real book. <laughs> and so I, I try to find balance. Um, I download books to read, you know, on the Kindle app, but I also buy paper books as well. And so I just alternate so that I get both. Mm-hmm. I really need to get better at reading real books. I do the audible thing a lot and I have a lot of books that I've like started, <laughs> but I just end up going to audible and downloading it and listening to the same book that I purchased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's okay too. If but it's all about balance, right? And so maybe you maybe you play a game with yourself and say, okay, for every Audible book I download, I have to buy one that's real paper. Or make it two to one. Mm-hmm. You know, just so yeah. you get it in there. And the other thing about only reading on the Kindle is the blue light issue and how it impacts sleep. And so if you're reading on your Kindle before bedtime, yes. then, you know, there's fallout there too. Yeah, totally. We just recently had a sleep expert actually on the podcast talking about that, um, Molly Eastman. And yeah, the blue light, it's so impactful to our metabolism to, yeah, so many layers of our brain function for the next day as well. And yeah, it can be really impactful. But I mean, we've still got to start somewhere, right? So if you start with a Kindle and reading, like that's, that's a good step one. But make it a Kindle, not the iPad where you can click over to other apps. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Something else I wanted to talk to you about um, was ADHD because I know that's a big field of interest and study for you. And so obviously in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there just seems to be a proliferation. Like it's to the point where it's common conversation in my social circles, professional circles. It seems like every second person has ADHD um, now. And there's a lot of people on social media that build their social media following around the fact that they have ADHD or, you know, there's lots of, you know, I get, I get videos myself. I don't necessarily have ADHD. I mean, I'm pretty wired most of the time, but, um, but generally it seems to be kind of everywhere. Like, what do you think has led to this proliferation? Do you think it's the, the modernization of the social media stuff that we're talking about and the, the constant ongoing stimulation that's just gone to an absolute other level, which we never foresaw 20 years ago? Or do you think we're now just able to identify it more easily with modern technology? Yes, I think there are several reasons why we see more of it now than we did three decades ago. Um, So let's talk about those. Um, One um, is awareness. And so once we became acutely aware of the ADHD diagnosis and we found out that it does impact girls as well as boys, we nearly doubled, you know, the number of kids who were being diagnosed because, oh, we need to be looking at the girls too. Most of them who have Um, the inattentive type, and they were falling through the cracks because they weren't exhibiting the hyperactivity that the young boys were exhibiting. And I'm talking about in the 80s and 90s, right? And so we did see this increase in in diagnosis then. And then one of the things that I see um, is starting in the classroom, a teacher frustrated with behavior suggesting to a parent, I think your child might have ADHD. You need to take them to the doctor and see. 
parent takes the child to the pediatrician and says, the teacher thinks my child has ADHD. The pediatrician goes down a quick checklist and says, I think that's consistent with what we're seeing. Here's medication. When we have a tendency to attach pathology to extreme ends of normal behavior. And so that is not necessarily an ADHD diagnosis, but a child who is struggling has some symptoms that are consistent with ADHD, but could have biological causes, could have environmental causes, could have social, emotional, developmental causes. And so I think that it's overdiagnosed by the pediatricians um, who are responding to desperate parents who are responding to desperate teachers. So um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that children who are evaluated by child psychologists, developmental psychologists, or a developmental pediatrician, those are accurate diagnoses for the most part. But when the general pediatrician um, just runs a checklist, um, I think that that's overdiagnosed for sure. I, of course, some of them probably do have it. But many times it's just um, behavior that we could approach differently as parents and teachers to help that child mm -hmm. through that stage um, with whatever that struggle is. Um, and again, we could talk about sleep patterns. We could talk about dietary patterns. We could talk about exposure to toxins. We could look at MTHFR mutations. Um, there are epigenetic reasons why we're seeing um, ADHD behaviors as well as diagnoses. Um, so I think those are the, those are two reasons why um, we see it. But I, I really feel like we have a tendency to slap labels on things when they're difficult. It's frustrating. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, yeah. Well, and I didn't actually know how you were going to answer that question. So I actually totally feel the same. And I think that's one of the limitations of the, the amount of power that doctors have to be able to put those labels on people, despite not being super educated or appropriate to be necessarily the person diagnosing that type of situation. It's just like when you go, at least here in Australia, when you go to get uh, a mental health care plan or antidepressants, the checklist is so brief and and like usually the doctor won't venture into asking any meaningful questions that would elicit a meaningful response that would give context. It's like, oh yeah, you're depressed. And that, that label can render people never allowed to work in certain jobs because they've been depressed, right? And it's just based on this, you know, five, 10, 15 minute appointment that you have and it's just tick this box, tick this box, do a, do a calculation and it's like, oh, based on this number um, and whether it be depression or ADHD or whatever the classification that people are seeking out is, it just feels like it's just such an inadequate process to come to such a meaningful label that has such impact on people's lives. Yes, yes. and I mean, you get an ADHD label you can't get into the military if you're medicated, right? I mean, that's huge. You have a teenager who decides they want to serve their country and can't yeah. in America because they've been medicated with Ritalin for ADHD. Um, you you struggle to get life insurance if you've had a depressive a depression diagnosis. I mean, there are ramifications yeah. to not being not going through a thorough diagnostic workup for sure. Um, but I do want to say, well, first of all, yeah. I'm an ADHD warrior myself. Um, I was diagnosed in college. Um, so I do want to say that there are differences in the brain between people who have ADHD and people who do not. We do know that, or we surmise that the dopamine and norepinephrine function is different in ADHD than it is, um, in neurotypical brains. So I am not discounting. Different in what way? Different in what way? So we don't know if it's a reuptake issue um, or if it's a production issue with those neurotransmitters. So, I mean, you know, right. it's very difficult to measure them in vivo. So, um, yeah, e yeah either, totally. either, you know, the neuron is releasing it from one side and they can't, the, you know, the receiving neuron can't grab them or we're just not producing enough. 
So one or the other, Mm -hmm. we just know that, um, there is an issue there. And then we can see connectivity changes, um, in the brain when we use, um, PET scan, MRI, QEG, um, spec scan, all, all of those have shown differences between the ADHD brain and the neurotypical brain. <clears throat> so certainly not discounting that that's a real diagnosis. I just think that we're seeing overdiagnosis. For sure. And uh, how, do you, how do you manage it? Like what, what works for you to be able to be effective and pull the best out of yourself uh, whilst also navigating those challenges? Yeah. So <clears throat> we did this really big study um, on nearly 5,000 people um, ages 4 through 40 um, where we created cognitive profiles based on IQ tests, you know, where we looked at the individual cognitive skills Um, children through adulthood, right, of people with ADHD. And we said, okay, let's see which cognitive skills are the weakest across the lifespan in ADHD. And what we found was that memory and processing speed were weaker than attention. And so we think of attention as being attention deficit. There's no deficit of attention in ADHD. We have too much attention. We can't differentiate between what's important and what isn't. So we pay attention to everything. So it's not an attention problem. It's it's a working memory, long-term memory and processing speed problem. So interventions that are only addressing attention are missing the boat. Like they're missing the boat on what's really happening in the brain. And so we have to do something to improve our memory, our processing speed, both working and long-term memory and our processing speed. And so I'm a firm believer that cognitive training is the way to get there. Um, But then you also need Mm -hmm. external supports as well. And so I don't function without a planner. I think it's super important to write it down. If I don't write it down, it doesn't exist. Um, And that's a great way to stay organized, whether you have ADHD or not, right? But I think it's essential (laughs) for the ADHD brain. Um, And then you have to watch your diet. Again, like I could say this a million times, um, you you have to limit sugar and you have to limit grains. You have to take omegas if you want to um, have the best chance of efficient neural processing. Um, and you have to sleep. If you don't sleep, your brain doesn't function, right? Um, my best friend is a neuroscientist and she says that sleep is like putting your brain through a car wash. It's, it's how we get rid of the toxins <laughs> because when we use up our neurotransmitters during the day, it creates toxins in the brain and sleep actually cleanses the brain of those toxins from the neurotransmitter being used up. And so we have to sleep. And if we're not help- making sure our kids are sleeping well, um, then we're fighting upstream um, with diet, um, nutritional supplementation, sleep, and stress management. And so... We know that if we're living in a state of chronic stress, then our bodies are producing cortisol and adrenaline. And when you're in that constant state of cortisol production, then your amygdala hijacks your prefrontal cortex and you can't reason, right? Your emotion center of your brain takes over and you can't reason. If you can't reason, then you can't manage your emotions. So it's kind of like a bi-directional connection um, between the emotion center of our brain and you know the reasoning center of our brain. Um, and so if we don't do some sort of mindfulness or meditative work, um, then how are we going to lower those cortisol levels? And children are stressed. They are stressed. And we don't think of it that way, right? We think of it as just adults dealing with this chronic stress state. Um, but children are stressed too. And so we have to help them. First of all, we have to be able to regulate our own emotions, right? It's called co-regulation. We have to be able to manage our own so that we can have one foot out and one foot in their emotions and help them regulate Mm -hmm. theirs. Um, So again, diet, sleep, stress management, nutritional supplementation. What am I missing? Um, Cognitive training. Oh, it's all amazing. You're speaking my language. (laughs) Healthy relationships is another one that might you might add in there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. If we if we don't connect with other people, I mean, we were created to connect. Um, and so we know for brain health in general, yeah. I mean, that's one of the brain health pillars that we talk about for the aging population is those social connections and how important those are. 
Um, and so from a parenting perspective, um, you know, I talk to parents all the time and say, everything that comes out of your mouth either strengthens the connection with your child or weakens the connection with your child. And so we have to think twice before we speak to our child because we want everything to strengthen that connection. Does that mean we don't say no? Of course not. Yeah. But we say it in a way that doesn't damage the, that relationship with our child. And, uh, you know, I see mm-hmm. parents take cell phones away as a punishment from their kids. And I tell them, find something else. Find another consequence for a misbehavior than disconnecting your child from their friends. And so we mm-hmm. know... Um, that connection is the number one buffer against mental health health crisis, the number one buffer. And so if we sever connections between our children and their friends, then we're increasing the risk of suicidality and mental health crisis. So find another consequence. I'm a big fan of manual labor. My carpets need to be shampooed. This is your consequence. You get to (laughs) shampoo the carpets. You get to you know, rebuild the rock wall outside, whatever, manual labor, I'm all for it, but don't sever those social connections. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. There's so much that you just talked about just then that I want to pull out and pull apart. So maybe we'll have to hang out again on another podcast, but thank you so much for sharing all of this fantastic knowledge and, and a bit of your own journey in there too. I think this is going to be really useful uh, for a lot of parents as well as just people that are struggling on their own because as you were talking about in the context of ADHD, the sleep, the diet, all of that stuff impairs brain function in everybody, yes. like literally everybody. The amount of people that don't have any mental health uh, or brain diagnoses at all that um, come to me with brain fog associated with their diabetes or their obesity or the, just their food choices in general is like through the roof. They can't focus or the, you know they're sort of wired, wired all the time because their brain's buzzing on sugar is just astronomical. And the sleep p- piece, like that what car wash that you talked about is basically the system that prevents or should prevent dementia and Alzheimer's, which is um, obviously also proliferating right now as well. But Amy, you're a fantastic human. Thanks for doing the work that you do. Um, where can everybody come and hang out with you and find you on the internet? Uh, yeah. So if if you want to know more about cognitive training, um, you can go to learningrx.com. Um, and we are actually all over the world. We're in 45 countries. And so um, outside of the U.S., um, then go to brainrx.com. Um, so you can also find me um, at amymorephd.com. And that's my personal website that has links to everything I do. Um, and then you can find me on Facebook and LinkedIn at Amy Lawson Moore. And I'm also Fantastic. a podcast host. So um, that is at the Brainy Moms on every social media site or the Brainy Moms.com um, if you want to find Maddie's episode and every other episode that we do. And that's a that's a podcast that helps moms do their jobs a little bit better. Amazing. All the best podcast guests are podcast yeah. host, uh, hosts as well. So amazing. <laughs> yeah. And to wrap up, so we've got one more question, which is, what is one piece of health information that you wish more people knew about? Yeah, and I think I said it uh, midway through that we are not stuck with the cognitive cards we've been dealt. And so whether you're struggling with age-related cognitive decline or post-COVID brain fog or a neurodevelopmental disorder that is just impacting um, your ability to process information, or if you have a child um, who's struggling with a neurodevelopmental disorder or ADHD, we can change those cognitive skills through targeted cognitive training delivered by a human. Um, the research is strong. Um, we see lives changed all day, every day with that intervention. And so that is a message of hope that I just love to share, that we're just not stuck. We can, we can change our brains. 
I love that. We can change our brains. Amy, thanks so much for being here on the show. Everyone will have definitely loved what you had to say, so I hope it gets out to many, many, many people. And I'll, if for anybody that's listening, if you've enjoyed this episode, you got something out of it, um, or you feel like you need to share it with a friend that maybe it's got some kids with ADHD or just anybody that you think is going to benefit, please send it over. Tag us on social media if you share it there as well. Uh, and feel free to give us a five-star rating on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you hang out listening to this episode. It's very much appreciated. And Amy, I will We'll catch you really soon. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Maddie. Bye. Bye.